forever. You know whenever we link up, my nigga, they think this shit come from outer space or something. There's a kind of a fundamental basis for post-traumatic slave syndrome. How many of you are familiar with post-traumatic stress disorder? Yeah. Okay. So these are things, I mean, most of you are, are, are people who are in the field that have done the work. You're here representing uh, the people who are really in the trenches, and I appreciate and respect that. Uh, the theory very often, uh, when people hear it, post-traumatic slave syndrome, I try to kind of get at uh, uh, kind of what's going on in the room. There are, there's ambivalence, there's feelings of, you know, what? Come on now. What are we saying now about the slavery thing? It's over. You know, it's get over it. <laughs> you know, it's, we're done. We have that kind of feeling. And how possibly is she drawing a connection between something that happened so long ago in contemporary society? You know, come on, are you trying to find an excuse? Are you trying to blame people? You know, these are the natural kind of knee-jerk reactions to hearing the term post-traumatic slave syndrome. However, I would, I would submit to you that, you know, my, it's based on research. So uh, I did about six years of, of research specifically looking at violence. My area of, of, of focus is violence. And I'll cover that in my, um, my PowerPoint. Also, some of you may not be able to see points of the PowerPoint, uh, but we're going to make it available to you. So you don't have to worry about it. I, there's a website where you'll be able to download my PowerPoint. Isn't that correct? Is that, did I say that right? OK. So that, that part you don't have to worry about. But I kind of want to set the ground so that we can all advance and move forward together. Now, the reason I do that and the reason why I began that way is because there's an assumption, a fundamental assumption, in a room this size with people very well educated, people very well exposed, that we're all entering this discussion at the same level. And we are not. I can guarantee you we are not. We all have our ideas and our beliefs, and then we all have our experience. For example, the people of color that are in the room, all the people of color that are in this room are arriving in this room at a different level because they have lived in this skin. And we're rarely given any kind of appreciation or understanding of what you have to live with walking through the world with the skin. So it, you're, you kind of come in at a different level of awareness about the discussion. And then you have folks that come into this discussion that are educated around it, that are clear about it, but can't really empathize their way through it. In other words, it's not a feeling thing, it's a cerebral thing. So some people stay intellectual because that's a level of comfort. Nothing wrong with that. But very different from the person who lives in the skin. It is personal and it is emotional. <laughs> OK, so all of that's going on in this room even before we get started. But as people commit it, you know, it may get a bit uncomfortable. But that's OK. Because it's been uncomfortable living in this skin. <laughs> it's been uncomfortable. And we have to learn how to deal with that discomfort and stay in the room. So when we look at the fundamental premise of trauma, and we understand the nature of trauma, we know that there have been other groups that we've looked at the etiology of, their, of contemporary behavior based on multi-generational trauma. One group, Jewish Holocaust, families of Jewish Holocaust, and the fact that the Jewish community is very, very clear about honoring that Holocaust. So much so that Spielberg will probably make another movie. And I'm not mad at him. Because what he's doing is ensuring that the generations that come will never forget the Holocaust and its impact upon Jewish people. You'll look at folks throughout the world, even aboriginal folks in the United States, where more focus is being done on what colonialism has done. We've looked at uh, Japanese internment. We've looked at Australian aboriginal folks. We've looked at multi-generational impact of trauma on people who have had tragedies, like the tsunami victims. We'll look at everybody. But when it comes to looking at Africans, there's a visceral response. Oh, come on, let's not. Why are you? And it's a curious thing, as a social scientist, to me, that you get so much pushback when you talk about Africa. And we look at the legacy of slavery. You get so much pushback. But more importantly is why do you get the pushback? See, as a social scientist, I'm less concerned with the material, which I'm clear about. I'm more interested in why the behavior. Why is there such reticence at looking at this issue? 
And there's, the answer is, when you peel back the layers of this, we peel back everybody's layers. Everyone gets naked in this room, and that's not always comfortable. It's also very comfortable to talk at, about the other's pathology. And the reason why I think that becomes important is so that when we begin to engage in this discussion, we don't find ourselves falling victim to the fear, guilt, all of that stuff that's no, not useful to anyone. It's not useful. This means we're going to peel the layers back. And while 246 years, as it were, in American history of American chattel slavery, starting with 1619, to the ratification of the 13th Amendment in the United States. We're looking at 246 years of American chattel slavery. And it's very comfortable, and I think to some degree people can say, you can't have 246 years of trauma and expect that nothing happened, especially when that trauma was followed by more trauma, especially given the fact that there was never a point of healing. Not difficult to do the math here. Not, this is not deep and philosophical. It really makes sense. But you know what else is true? You can't have 246 years of folks engaged in a traumatic experience that were white that went unaffected. That means everybody has been affected and infected by this thing. So that's the part that gets uncomfortable, because it's usually OK to look at the other. We're going to look at everybody. This is going to be one where we really uh, show the elephant in the room. And only for the purposes of recognizing that unless we do so, none of us can heal. This is not a process that any of us can do individually by ourselves. This is a collective process. And so therefore, we are all going to be engaged. And it's not just a pointing of fingers at anyone. It's recognizing that you and I, all of us, have been impacted by historical multi-generational trauma. Now, let's look at it very specifically. When we look at trauma in its very you know, clinical sense, you know, my background in clinical psychology, understanding what trauma is, people can experience a single trauma, one trauma, indirectly, meaning that they didn't have to be present for the direct trauma. Meaning, say for example, you all heard about 9-11 and taking down the buildings in New York, right? Yes? 9-11. <laughs> everybody in the world got told about that. Matter of fact, I think everybody in America got diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of that. But I would submit to you we were traumatized long before that. But there were individuals that were at ground zero, and I know them. My niece was in one of the buildings. So she decided, while she was in one of the buildings, they kept telling her, just stay where you are. They kept saying, stay where you are. We think people should stay where they are. She said, and everything in her mind said, get out. So she got out. Matter of fact, she leapt over the security guard <laughs> to get out of the building. And it's a good thing she did. But during that time, there were people at Ground Zero, for example, like my niece. And there were people who watched it on television. And then there were people in other countries who heard about it. So there are varying levels of understanding around this trauma that happened in the United States. There were people at ground zero, were there, had saw folks falling out the sky, got videotaped footage of it, watched it on television, invited folks over and drank beer. Not traumatized. No trauma. There were people in, maybe in another country, in Brazil, saw it on television in psychotherapy right now, can't get on planes, on medication, and people talk softly to them twice a week. So the variance in terms of those who are traumatized by a traumatic event and those who are not, we're unique as individuals. Everybody's not traumatized by a traumatic event, whether it's direct or not. But when we start talking about chattel slavery, we're not talking about one trauma. We're not talking about a specific event. We're talking about generations of trauma with no intervention. Based on what I know about sugar plantations, tobacco, and the Caribbean, what I know about American chattel slavery and the plantations there, does anyone right now ever recall mental health assistance to slaves? Anybody remember sending in the therapist after I sold off your son, daughter, raped folks, 
any, in, at any point. Never. Second question. After slavery was officially over, now you're free. Anybody any remember, remember any therapy then? We know it's been rough. It's been deep for you. It's been difficult. We're going to do a little group therapy. Anybody remember that? That would be no. Number three, after slavery officially ended, both in the States, in the Caribbean, the British ended, do you remember whether or not trauma continued? Did the trauma continue for people of African descent? I need to know. OK, so now let's do the math. Hundreds of years of trauma, no treatment. Freed, more trauma, no treatment. What do you do to math? Do you think there may be residual impacts of that trauma? Of course there is. It didn't end, friends, and it hasn't ended yet. So I think one, on one point, African people and people of African descent are extremely resilient. Matter of fact, I think we're a miracle. Far be it for us to pathologize or to look and cast this idea of weak and sick people. Oh, on the contrary, we are I'm profoundly resilient because we've done everything we've done thus far with no help, with not even the ability to have this discussion. As though it were possible, we escaped injury in all those hundreds of years and the years that followed. So this, this kind of journey I'm going to take you on is going to be one that really gives a perspective on what this trauma was, what it looks like, and clinically, what is post-traumatic stress disorder? What does it look like? Now, let me give you a little snapshot. We'll get into it in more depth a little later. But post-traumatic stress disorder, if in fact you are diagnosed with that, Again, remember, direct or indirect trauma. Here are some of the symptoms. A feeling of foreshortened future. Now, what does that mean? A feeling, well, you're not going to live long. How many of you are running into young people that don't believe they're going to make it past their 20s? Feeling of foreshortened future. Exaggerated startle response. Outbursts of anger. Difficulty falling or staying asleep. Hypervigilance. Right? These are symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. This is like DSM stuff, Diagnostic Statistical Manual Mental Disorders. It's in there. And there's a whole listing of all these symptoms. Now, I want to roll it back so you can understand what, I, what the transmission theory is, because I'm going to talk about transmission. So how does a person that's been traumatized by post-traumatic, literally has a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, and can we, if we are logical and we are reasonable people, assume that a fair number of Africans had to have had post-traumatic stress disorder? You think? I'm not talking about us, I'm talking about them. Untreated, though, right? OK, so now let's do the math. Mom, who saw dad sold or sister raped, has post-traumatic stress disorder. Still mom, though, right? Only mom now has outbursts of anger, feeling of foreshortened future, difficulty falling or staying asleep, hypervigilance. That would be mom. Now, Johnny or Mary or Shaquisha does not have, did not have the original trauma. But what are they learning? This is called social learning theory. What am I normalizing? Exaggerated startle response. Outbursts of anger. Do, are you following me? So I didn't have to be traumatized. Now, the other thing is, do you think Johnny and Mary got traumatized too? Do you see? So what happens in your environment, you learn from the significant others in your environment. And if they're broken, guess what you're going to be? You're learning from broken people. And you're normalizing that behavior. And then it becomes, years later, 2008, that's their culture. That's just the way they are. That's their culture. So there's poison in the cookies, right? But how are you going to tease out that poison? That means you have to look at the etiology of the behavior, which is what I spent many years doing. And it's not rocket science. This is not deep. Like I said, this is not required that you know, someone has. You know, it's just common sense. How many of you in the room think you can cook? Come on now. I know it's a strange place. You all have the oddest food in the world. I'm trying to tell you that now. Those of you. Those, the, those of you that know how to cook, who taught you how to cook? Mom, dad, family. Who do you think taught them? 
Hello, social learning theory. You learn from those in your environment. And if they couldn't cook, yeah, the likelihood is you can't eat. Okay. So there's things that we, and we don't question them. This is what goes in the curry. What are you talking about? This is how you make curry. Well, how you know? Because that's the way my mother made it. Well, maybe, you know, she didn't get the recipe right. Actually, I wrote Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, the book, which is, is here. The book is called Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, America's Legacy of Enduring Injury and Healing. I recently have written a study guide, which is being edited now. But the reason why I wrote the book is really to put a name to what I was looking at. I started to look at behaviors in African people and people of African descent. Very long time, people asked me all the time. I just was inter inter interviewed by ABC, and they wanted to know how did what, where did this come from? It came from growing up black. No, there's nothing deep there. I grew up looking at black folks and wondering why we behaved the way we did. did. Very little had to do with white people. Very little. I was looking at black people, and I wanted to understand our behavior. I am 50 years old, and I remember looking at people who were, um, you know, growing up in, in South Central Los Angeles. That's where I grew up. My, pa my parents are from the South, from Louisiana, and from Belize. And one of the things that I started to notice are certain behaviors that, that black people engaged in that I started realizing, not just African Americans, African Caribbean people, I came here, heard the same thing, behaviors around uh, our, what we look like, like for example, I would hear people, and you all, most people here, white or black, or wherever you are in the spectrum, you've seen the behavior and wondered about it. And I know you have, because I wondered about it. Well, you have black people that aren't black. How many people have met black people that actually aren't black? Now, this is an interesting phenomenon. These are black people that will tell you before, you know, first of all, they, they certainly look black to me. They look black, but they don't say they're black. They, well, you know, I've got quite a bit of Indian in me. Did I mention that you know, I have a lot of my family are from, you know, all of a sudden there's something else, right? And you're looking going, sure could have fooled me, you look black <laughs> to me, right? Now this would be something that I could ignore if it stopped when I was a child in South Central, but it didn't. You can hear it in rap music today. Same behavior. Matter of fact, the rap videos, that, they just need to clone the same girl, right? You can, I can draw her right now, what she looks like. The little wavy hair, and, you know, she, she's black, but not too black, okay? And what is that about? What is its etiology, and why does it persist? That means that it's an intracultural phenomenon that's being passed along through generations. But why? What is this self-loathing that I see in contemporary black folks? I'm not going back to slavery. I'm talking about today who hate and despise the reflection in the mirror. That's what I wanted to know. So that's what led me on my journey, if you will. Again, not an unusual journey. In our, of course, I'm going to kind of pop back and forth through British history and American history. James Madison was a very important figure um, in American history, president of the United States, 1751, 1836. He said, blacks are inhabitants, but as debased by servitude below the equal level of free inhabitants, which regards the slave as divested of two-fifths of the man. This is the, um, this is called the, uh, the three-fifths compromise. And what they were trying to figure out uh, is, what are we going to do? How are we going to count these, these black folks? Because you know, based on how many people you have residing in a particular state, the more representatives you can send, send to the House of Representatives, and thus the more power that particular state can wield. So the question was, how do you count the slaves? Well, Southerners, who, of course, enjoyed slavery, uh, they wanted to count them. They said, yeah, count them. That gives us more power. Where the Northerners saw it as an opportunity to abolish slavery, said, well, you can't count them because you don't consider them human. How can you count people who have absolutely no freedom that you do not count or be, treat as human beings? So the agreed-upon solution is to count three-fifths of a state's total slave prop, you know, population 
And so as a, as a result, they became three-fifths of a man, divested of that. But it's almost as though you're not talking about a human being anymore. And that's what's scary about this. And I, and I always start my talks by saying that when you see folks dressed up like this, and I know you all see a lot of them, you should get worried. I always get concerned when I see them dressed up like that, like this guy here. This next guy was, was someone that str I struggled with. You, you all know him, Richard Oswald. He's the son of a Presbyterian minister, international trader of enslaved Africans. What's so deep about this gentleman is how wealthy he became as a result. He would be worth, based on the 1700s, right now he would be worth 68 million. Based on the number of slaves, the slave trade, and colonies, ships, all the stuff that he basically utilized. But again, uh, these folks are held in high regard. When I read about him in your history, one would, you would never know, Google him. You'd never know the ugly trade that he was engaged in because we've sanitized it, you see. It all got kind of sanitized. But what's important is to understand the wealth amassed. And see, this is where people get afraid, particularly Europeans. This is where the whole, oh my God, dare I say the big ugly word, most folks are afraid of, because we don't really care too much about the healing, the healing stuff. Go on and get better, you people but don't try to touch the resources. That would be reparations. We don't want to have that conversation. We're okay if you all go heal, <laughs> however you're going to do that. But mm, let's not talk about the reparation story. But when you start looking at the wealth amassed, and then you've got to look at the Church of England. Mm, it gets real ugly, because then you start realizing what is a foundation for the Church of England. Folks that bless the slave ships. And then, of course, and this is interesting about uh, John Newton, because we all know about, in every, the first thing you hear, John Newton, what's the next thing you hear? Amazing Grace. John Newton, Amazing Grace. Well, let's figure out what happened before he got Amazing Grace. He said, slaves are lesser creatures without Christian souls, and thus are not destined for the next world. Now, what becomes important about this kind, and you'll see it both in American history as well, it, there is this kind of dehumanization of African people. Because you got to ask yourself this question, how do people who deem themselves superior, who see themselves as the civilizers, who recognize themselves as the, what we call manifest destiny, the white man's burden of civilizing all the rest of the, the races, how do you reconcile being the superior being and engaging in barbaric behavior? What that produces is something called cognitive dissonance. How many people are familiar with that? Cognitive dissonance is really thinking discord. It's when you begin to feel conflict between what you believe or understand or hold to be true, and you are then faced with behaviors, either in yourself or others, that conflict with your fundamental belief. It produces cognitive dissonance. Human beings don't function well with cognitive dissonance. You must remove the cognitive dissonance in order to function. So in order for people to perpetuate slavery and to perpetuate that whole system that lasts for centuries, you had to remove all dissonance associated with it. Can't be anything wrong with me. Certainly isn't us. We're the civilizers. We're the superior, so it must be them. Oh, yes. Well, you see, they don't even have souls. Now I can go to sleep because I'm not really dealing with a human being. Are you following me? 